This episode is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Use Surfshark VPN to keep your identity safe online. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and this week on Mythology Explained, we are talking about the most handsome man in the history of human existence. No, not me, but I appreciate you saying that. What? No, not Rob Schneider either. Really? I say most handsome man and the first two people you think of are me and Rob Schneider? Are you sick? You know what? Not important. Because today we are talking about Adonis, the god of fertility, beauty, desire, and permanent renewal, and his romance with Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. Now, if you've been watching the channel for a while now, then you know that we're no stranger to the Greek romances. There was Orpheus and Eurydice, Hades and Persephone, Cupid and Psyche. Hell, we even covered the affair that Helios' daughter had with a bull. But this one is especially unique. Why? Because it actually doesn't end in tragedy? Don't be ridiculous. It totally ends in tragedy. It's just that for once we're following a handsome lad who not only doesn't care about the effect he has on women, he can barely force himself to care about the goddess who's fallen madly in love with him. And he has one of the most messed up origin stories of any Greek character we've talked about in the past. And that includes the Olympians, who were literally eaten and then thrown up by their father. Yep, you guys are in for an extra special episode. Before we dive into it though, I've got to give a shout out to this week's sponsor. In this day and age, when people are spending an average of six to eight hours on the internet per day, it's more important important than ever to make sure your private information is safe. That's why I use Surfshark VPN to keep my information hidden from online predators. For the insanely low price of $1.99 a month, I'm able to have unlimited simultaneous connections. Meaning that if I'm going ham on my research and working on my laptop, desktop, and iPad, they can all be connected and protected at the same time. They can even keep my Xbox safe. What's really cool is that Surfshark VPN does way more than just protects your data when you're online. It also has this incredible feature called HackLock where you can be notified in real time about your emails and passwords that are at risk of being hacked. That, as well as Blind Search, a private and ad-free way of searching where your activity won't be tracked for the benefit of those creepy advertising companies that want to give you targeted ads. Hell, even Surfshark won't know what you're doing. One of my favorite features, though, is No Borders Mode, which not only allows you to surf the internet you know and love in more restrictive countries like China, but you can also use it to watch your favorite shows on Netflix if they're no longer carried in your country, or if you happen to do some traveling. That's right, you get all of those features and more for less than two dollars a month but to make the deal even sweeter if you sign up through my url surfshark.deal slash john solo you'll save 85 percent and get three extra months free consider checking it out if you want to keep your private information safe online and support the channel while you're doing it and now it's time for us to get started as always make sure you hit that like button and subscribe if you want to support the channel and get content like this delivered to your sub box every single week you of course don't have to but legend says that anyone who doesn't do both will be smart smited or smitten smote you'll be smote by zeus before this video is over so you might want to just to be safe So normally when we talk about the Greek deities, we start with a brief overview before diving into the myths. But today we're actually gonna change that up on account of the stories providing some very valuable context for what Adonis presided over and the way he was worshiped. And I think we can all agree that there is no better place to start than the very messed up myth that details how Adonis was conceived. A long time ago in a country far, far away lied the kingdom of Cyprus, where the king and queen had just welcomed their beautiful baby girl, Mira, into the world. In fact, that baby was so beautiful that her mother compared her to the most gorgeous of all the deities, Aphrodite, and she did not appreciate that. To punish the royal family for their insolence, Aphrodite cursed baby Mira to grow up with an unnatural attraction to her own father, King Cinerus. Yeah, nice one, Aphrodite. Don't punish the sinner. Torture the innocent little baby who can't even pick her head up at this point instead. And also, don't explain why to anyone. That'll really teach him. You see, this curse led to some serious problems for the poor girl. Throughout her entire childhood, she fought these urges that she knew were wrong and prayed for them to go away. But for reasons she just didn't understand, she couldn't help but want to jump her dad's bones. There's a phrase I never thought I'd say. When Mira had finally reached her teenage years, the pain became too much for her to bear and she tried hanging herself. But before any long-term damage could be done, her childhood nurse walked in and saved her. The nurse then sat down with Mira, whom she had loved like she was her own daughter, and convinced her to tell the truth about how she'd been feeling. And when the princess finally came clean, the nurse said, Ew, 
Gross. Just kidding, she thought of a plan to help. A few nights later, at the annual festival of Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, the nurse finds King Cinerus, who is plastered at this point, and tells him there's a beautiful maiden who has a deep passion for him waiting in one of the bedrooms. He asks the nurse what the age of this mysterious maiden was, and she replied, the same age as your daughter. And for some reason, that seemed to be exactly what the king wanted to hear. Later that night, Cinerus entered the bedroom where all the lights were off and proceeded to have sex with his own daughter without knowing it was his own daughter. I know, it's kind of hard to believe, but remember, Homie was drunk and effectively blind, so he wasn't in the most coherent state of mind. What makes it even worse, though, is that it happened more than once. In fact, depending on the version, it could have happened four, nine, or even 12 times. 12 times! You could watch a Star Wars movie for every time they had sex, and they would still have one to go after you finished the anthology films. You'd have to watch the Clone Wars movie to tie it up, and who would want to do that? Well, after the dozenth time getting busy with someone that he couldn't even pick out of a lineup, the king got curious and snuck a light into the room with him for the 13th night together. He ends up turning it on and revealing that it's his own daughter, which fills him with disgust and rage. That's not all though. There's some versions where, before he does this, he's informed that the mysterious maiden is pregnant with his child, and that's why he smuggles the light in there. So when he turns it on, he realizes that it's his child who is pregnant with his child. And remember, these aren't gods we're talking about, they're mortals, so incest is super not okay. The the king responds to this nightmarish news by pulling out a sword and trying to kill Miro with it, but the girl manages to escape and sneaks out of the kingdom without looking back. When she finally decides that she's put enough distance between her and her father, Mira prays to the gods for help, but not in the way that you would expect. You might think she wants their help in calming her father down or taking her away to another kingdom where she can start a new life with her little incest baby, but you'd be wrong. Instead, she asks to be removed from the kingdom of the living, but also denied death because she doesn't think she deserves the peace that would would come with it. I know, how depressing is that? Well, one of the gods hears her, we don't know which one, and gives her an unusual fate by turning her into a myrrh tree. Only what Mira didn't realize was that this fate wouldn't stop her child from being born. It continued to grow inside of her new body, which caused her incredible pain that she couldn't even cry out from. The good news is that the all-knowing Hera, the goddess and protector of women and family, could sense that Mira was in trouble. So she appeared before the disgraced princess, said some magic incantations that would help her, and in that moment, the the tree split open, freeing her baby boy. Then Hera gave him to the water nymphs who wrapped him in soft grasses and bathed him in his mother's tears, which they gathered like they would fruit from a tree. What I tell ya, it's gotta be one of the most messed up origin stories for a god that we've talked about, right? So, Adonis is born. Now what? Well, like usual, there's a few different versions of what happens next, and while we are going to touch on each of them, our primary focus today is the rendition found in the poet Ovid's book Metamorphoses, because it's by far the most detailed account. Unfortunately, it does skip around 20 years or so ahead, so we don't know who ended up raising Adonis, but again, we'll talk about that a little later. Until then, we can just assume the nymphs were his guardians. So one day, when Aphrodite and her son Cupid were chinchillin', either in the heavens or in the woods, the goddess spotted the handsome Adonis is hunting and found herself infatuated with this new creature. Now Cupid ends up getting a little jealous over her sudden adoration for the mortal as she was comparing his looks to that of a god's, but she reassured him that he was still the most beautiful boy she'd ever seen. That is, until he accidentally pricks Aphrodite with his golden arrow when he leans in to give her a kiss. After that, the only thing she cares about in the world is locking down Adonis as her lover. She ends up approaching him, they exchange a few words, and Adonis soon realizes he's talking to the one and only Aphrodite. Only here where it gets really interesting. While most men would put their entire lives on hold to spend even a few minutes with the beautiful goddess, there was something Adonis liked even more than women hunting. So while he was happy to have Aphrodite around, he actually didn't care as much as you would think. As a result, Aphrodite had to sacrifice her lifestyle of comfort and maximizing her beauty to join her new boy toy as he hunted. After a while, Aphrodite has to go somewhere else on business, because she is a goddess with other responsibilities after all. Before she goes though, she warns Adonis that while he's free to hunt rabbits, deer, fowls, etc., he should avoid pursuing dangerous beasts like wolves, bears, and boars. To which Adonis responds, yeah. Yeah, see you later. Being that Adonis was a young man with a bold heart and a lot to prove to himself, he straight up ignored her advice, and the very next thing he went after was a wild boar. He tries to kill it by throwing his spear, but the beast actually dislodges the weapon with its tusks, then charges toward the hunter. Adonis did his best to get out of the way, but the boar was too fast for him, and its tusks sink into him, groin first. 
Ouch. Now while all this was going down, Aphrodite was flying through the air on her dainty little chariot pulled by silver swans, but suddenly she heard her lover cry out in pain, so she pulled the U-turn and ventured back. What the goddess found when she returned broke her heart into a million pieces. The man she had fallen madly in love with was lying lifeless in a pool of his own blood. And Aphrodite had a very primal reaction to this. She started screaming, beating her own chest, ripped off her clothes, and pulled out her hair. Then she called out to the fates, the designers of destiny, that this would not be the last of Adonis' time or memory here on Earth. She said that every year on the anniversary of his death, she will lament for him, and in place of his blood, anemone flowers will bloom. She then poured nectar, the drink of the gods, onto his blood and transformed it into blood red flowers, which were soon carried away by the wind, and it was through this process that he was deified. The end. Kind of. While that really was the entirety of Adonis's life, there is one question that needs to be answered. Who was the boar? But John, I thought you said he tracked down the boar and was killed when he failed to slaughter it. That seems pretty straightforward. True, but in Greek mythology, things are rarely as simple as they seem on the surface. So we're going to start this section off with a version that I find to be the most ridiculous and hilarious. One where the boar wasn't even trying to hurt Adonis. When confronted by Aphrodite, he is extremely apologetic and says, I just wanted to give the beautiful man a kiss on his thigh and my tusks got in the way. Because you know, sometimes you see a man so beautiful, you just gotta kiss him. So it's a good thing that we're separated by a computer screen. Then there's another version that says the boar was actually Ares, the god of war, in disguise. Being that he and Aphrodite were lovers, he didn't appreciate being replaced placed by this mortal pretty boy and had to take him out of the picture. According to Euripides though, the beast was actually sent by the goddess of the hunt, Artemis, who wanted to punish Adonis for hunting in her territory. Not only that, but she also wanted to get revenge on Aphrodite, who caused the death of one of her favorite mortals, Hippolytus. But that's a whole nother story. I think my favorite version is the one where the boar was sent by Persephone, but it gets a little confusing here because it doesn't really mesh well with Ovid's rendition, and we have to retcon a few things. Remember how at the start of the last section we skipped about 20 20 years ahead to when Adonis was an adult, well this version actually starts soon after he was born. Instead of not laying her eyes on him until he's a fully grown man, Aphrodite instead finds Adonis when he's a baby, and she can already tell that he's going to be beautiful. Wanting to protect him from the world and hide him from the other gods, she gives him to Persephone, Hades' wife and queen of the underworld, for safekeeping. And I know what you're thinking, well Adonis is mortal so let's hope Aphrodite pokes some air holes in that box but it actually doesn't matter. Curiosity gets the better of Persephone like it once did Pandora. She opens the box and is immediately in awe over this beautiful little creature. She ends up taking care of him until he's a fully grown man and Aphrodite returns to collect him, but at this point, Persephone has grown way too attached and doesn't want to let him go. Because they can't reach a compromise on the matter, Zeus has to get involved and his solution is very similar to the one he thought of for Persephone back when Hades kidnapped her. He said that Adonis could spend one third of the year with Persephone, one third with Aphrodite, and one third with whomever he chose. Well, being that he just spent the past 20 or so years with Persephone, he felt like changing it up and went with Aphrodite, which really pissed off the queen of the underworld. To punish both Aphrodite and the man she raised from a baby, she sent the wild boar after him on his next hunt and killed him. That was actually the first and only version of the myth I ever knew, so imagine my surprise when I found all these other versions in my research. Despite his short life and tragic death though, Adonis was never forgotten by the Greeks, specifically the Greek women who celebrated him at the midpoint of every summer at the Festival of Adonia. At the start of this festival, women would plant a Garden of Adonis, a small garden of fast-growing plants like lettuce, fennel, wheat, or barley placed inside a basket or piece of pottery. These small gardens would then be set on the roof so they would grow quickly from the summer sun, then die quickly from the summer heat. During the garden's life, the ladies would also burn incense to honor Adonis. Once the plants finally withered, they would mourn the death of Adonis as obnoxiously as possible by screaming and beating their chests like Aphrodite did. Then they would ceremoniously carry a statuette of Adonis along with the small gardens to the Mediterranean Sea and throw them in the water. Sounds like a fun way to spend a Saturday, right? So that solo fam was the messed up myth of Adonis and Aphrodite according to Greek mythology. Have any thoughts? Personally, I found it interesting and oddly satisfying that Aphrodite ends up going through the worst heartbreak she'll ever experience as a result of the all too vicious curse that she put on innocent little Mira. Don't get me wrong, it's definitely sad that Adonis had to die for her to get a taste of her own medicine though. He did not deserve to have his groin ripped apart by a wild animal. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Are there any other observations or takeaways you want to share? Let me know 
and a comment down below. Also, if you have any suggestions for myths you want me to cover in the future, comment those down below as well. When you're through with that, make sure you leave a like if you enjoyed this episode and subscribe to see more content just like it on a weekly basis. I've also got links to my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram down below. Give those a follow for some thought-provoking questions about the stories we cover on this channel and to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news. Oh, and be sure to follow my own little Adonis on Instagram because he truly is one of the most beautiful doggos to ever exist. I'll be seeing you guys again next week with some extra special Messed Up Origins content. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.